Hey guys, good evening and welcome to the Ironman Arizona course info, tips and tricks and Q&A. Gotta say, I am excited for this one. Ironman Arizona is one of my favorite races. It's one of my favorite to participate in. It's one of my favorites to coach on site at. So looking forward to this evening and looking forward to the action next weekend. My name is John Mayfield. I am a two-time Ironman Arizona finisher myself. I've, I've finished uh, numerous other Ironman races as well, in addition to those in Arizona. I am a full-time triathlon coach. This is what I do. I have the privilege of having this as my career, and I am absolutely uh, passionate about what I do. I love what I do. Um, I am certified by USA triathlon at level two, as well as Ironman U. And I have coached hundreds of athletes from first timers to professionals and everyone in between. So what I want to do here this evening is share some of my experience, both as an athlete an Ironman, Arizona finisher, uh, and, and a coach to help increase your confidence and reduce your stress as race day approaches so that you can get the most out of this amazing opportunity that is Ironman Arizona. You can enjoy your time there in Tempe and you can produce your best possible results. All that training, all the blood, sweat, tears, sacrifice, time, money that has gone into this one day. I want you to get the absolute most out of it, perform your best and enjoy it for all that it is worth. So that's what I want to do here this evening. Uh, we'll be going over the course and uh, providing a little bit of insight, some tips, and uh, then at the end, I will answer as many questions as we have time to get to. So let's get started. All right, so a couple pre-race tips, a couple things to go over as you arrive in Tempe and in in even these last couple weeks, last couple days as race day approaches. Uh, it is absolutely critical to stay hydrated. Now, this is something I'm going to be talking about all evening, ad nauseum. In fact, let's go ahead, let's put a drinking game out there. Every time I talk about it, just go ahead and take a shot of your, your water, your Gatorade, whatever it is that your uh, electrolyte beverage of choice is, go ahead and take a shot of that and just go ahead and, and start working on that even now. Um, I, I always pass along this information regardless of the venue of the race, but the fact that uh, this race takes place in the middle of the desert makes this all the more critical. Uh, oftentimes, for those of us that live in uh, more more arid, more humid climates, uh, we're well aware when we're losing hydration, when we're, when we're sweating. Um, and, and that's just not the case necessarily in the desert. That air is so dry. Uh, you can be, be working, you can be sweating uh, and not even realize it. And uh, even if you're not sweating, you're still losing hydration at a faster rate. You'll notice that your skin dries out, your lips get dry simply because of that desert environment. So as important as hydration is, it is all the more important when you're spending time and when you're racing out in the desert like Ironman Arizona. So my tip for race week is to have a bottle of water with you at all times. So uh, just just stay sipping on it um, and, and keep up with it. So uh, not just plain water. If you drink uh, too much water, you'll inevitably flush out your electrolytes, where, which are uh, also very, very important. So uh, recommendation is to have something uh, with some electrolytes in it. My go-to for, for race week is vitamin water zero. Uh, I like the taste of it. It's got a good amount of electrolytes and uh, I'll come back to that uh, here, here in just a little bit. But uh, for, for race week, you should always have a water bottle with some electrolytes within, uh, within your reach. Limit time on your feet. You've got a lot of work to do on race day. You wanna make sure that you're not overdoing it in the days leading into the race. Now, there are certain things you have to do. You have to go down and, and get checked in. You have to go the day before the race and drop off your bike and your gear bags. So there are certain things you have to do. And obviously we wanna get those in addition to those last uh, few training sessions that are, that are part of your taper schedule. Those are important. But in addition to those, be aware and cognizant and manage the amount of time spent on your feet and pair that with your ongoing recovery modalities. So whatever you've been doing uh, in, 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 uh, throughout your training to, to stay healthy and injury free, make sure you're continuing those throughout uh, race week. So your um, compression boots, massage, foam roller, uh, all those kinds of things, make sure to bring those with you, continue to use those through race day. Now, uh, something that is, is largely specific to Ironman Arizona. Uh, this is a lesson I've learned the hard way. I mentioned it uh, just a second ago. 
lip balm and lotion. I, I live on the Texas Gulf Coast. It is very humid. I'm about 30 miles inland from the Gulf of Mexico. So I live in a very humid condition and my skin and my lips are, are used to it. So when I go out there to the desert, um, within hours, I really start to feel that dry air and, and my skin gets dry. It's itchy. And um, I, I've had it so bad that my lips were cracking and bleeding, which is just miserable. Um, so so along with that uh, electrolyte water bottle that's uh, uh, never too far from you, uh, de- definitely recommend some, some lip balm and some lotion as well. Uh, one thing that is absolutely critical, most of you are aware of this, but inevitably every time I do these webinars, there are one or two folks that don't know, you have to be checked in by Friday. So that means that you have to go down, check in, pick up your packet, all of that by Friday. There is no Saturday check-in. So if your travel arrangements do not have you in uh, town soon enough to to get down there before closing on on Friday. Uh, you need to adjust those. Uh, this is a a hard and fast thing. They do not make um, exceptions to this. So make sure that you are arriving in time uh, to to be checked in by the close of of the uh, check in time on Friday. From there, check out the course. Uh, what we want to do is be as prepared as possible. No surprises on race day. We want to know what we're in store for and have a plan and then execute on race day. So uh, all of your training sessions are an opportunity to begin uh, these these um, uh, your planning. And then what we want to do is go and actually put eyes on the course so then it becomes kind of a real thing. This is exactly what it looks like. This is what I'm in store for. Now I can execute my plan based on what I know and what I see. So um, great thing is that Mill Avenue Bridge, it's in the picture here. It's it's part of, of, of everything that kind of revolves around Ironman Arizona. You can see a whole lot of the course by just walking out on that bridge. Uh, obviously you can see the entire swim course. You can see the entire transition area. You can see the vast majority of the run course and even a little bit of the bike course. So uh, best way to check out the practice, uh, check out the swim course, is to participate in the practice swim. That is Saturday from nine until 1030. That is the only opportunity you will have uh, to get into the water prior to race day. So uh, a big thing here is is getting familiar uh, or getting a feel for that water temperature. We're gonna talk about that here in a few minutes, but uh, maybe you haven't swam in, in some water like this. And, and so this is gonna be a good opportunity just to get acclimated to it and feel exactly what you're in store for on race day. From there, recommend going and checking out the bike course. Um, we're going to, again, be talking extensively about that, but um, my definitions and my explanations may be a little different than your understandings of it. So make sure that uh, exactly, you know exactly what you're in store for. Go. Uh, great thing is it's a three-loop course, so uh, you don't actually have to drive 112 miles. You can actually just go and, and drive the much shorter uh, distance of the loop. It's actually less than 40 miles, so... Um, this is going to be about an hour, uh, very well spent, um, especially going out to the far end of the, uh, loop. That is where, um, the, uh, the most relevant, uh, portion of the course is don't want to have any spoiler alerts for what we're coming up. But again, we're going to talk about that and then run course. Uh, you, you, you hopefully have a couple of sessions, those in the last couple of days, uh, in your training plan to get in some last minute runs, great opportunity to go down there, um, and, and check out the course. So this, this, uh, course is, is very friendly to that. Lots of great opportunities to go, um, and, and swim bike and run actually on the course and get a good feel for what you're in store for on race day. Be sure to read the athlete guide. Uh, first timers have probably already read it a dozen times. Veterans probably think they know everything that's in it and, and you do, but inevitably there are oftentimes one or two little things that may be different from either years past or, um, other Ironman events that you have done. So, uh, make sure to give that, um, a, a read. So now a couple things that uh, these are sometimes a little bit controversial. Uh, I, I'm going to refer to them as even the kind of our myth busting portion uh, of our time together tonight. Um, one, I want to make sure that you're optimizing your tire pressure. Uh, a lot of people are using too much pressure in their tires. Uh, this is something that has changed over the last uh, decade or, or so. Um, back in the day, we used to think if some is good, more is better. Um, the more pressure we had, the less uh, 
uh, rolling resistance there was going to be. So we would put a bunch of air in the tires, expecting that to be faster. As wheels have gotten wider, tires have gotten wider, the optimized amount of pressure in that tire has gone down. So um, vast majority of athletes are, are putting uh, too much pressure in their tires. So um, make sure to optimize your tire pressure for your wheel width, your tire, your body weight, all that. My recommendation here is to check out the Silka uh, calculator, uh, Silka, S-I-L-C-A. Uh, they make bike accessories and they have a great online calculator that will tell you exactly how much pressure you need to be putting in your tires. So chances are um, it's probably less than uh, you might think, but uh, that lower tire pressure is going to actually improve your rolling resistance, make you faster, as well as reduce your risk of getting a flat. Uh, next one is a long-standing myth uh, in the triathlon space. Don't deflate your tires overnight. Uh, you're going to hear a ton of people uh, on Saturday when they're dropping off their bikes, letting air out of the tires. The thought is um, it's going to be cool overnight, which it will be. Uh, it's going to warm up later in the day, which is true. Um, and obviously when we have temperature change, the air is going to expand as it warms. The thought is that expanding air is going to cause your tire to pop. That is simply not the case. This is just a myth. Um, there's not that much air in the tire to begin with. These, these 700 CC, um, 25, 28 wide, uh, tires just don't hold that much air. The amount of temperature change necessary to cause that much expansion, um, would be a, a significant problem. Uh, we, we've got bigger problems than our, our bike tires if we have that big of a temperature swing. So, um, basically what's going to happen is, is you will probably hear, uh, some tires popping in on, on race morning, but it's not because of, of a change in tire pressure because of the temperature. Most of those athletes have, uh, put too much pressure, uh, in they've overinflated their tires, as we already mentioned, uh, or maybe they changed tires, changed tubes in the last couple of days. They got a pinch flat, something like that, that caused that tire to pop. But um, for those that do have that tire that pops overnight or early in the morning, that is actually a good thing because if it didn't pop overnight or first thing in the morning, there's a real good chance it was going to pop out on the course. So it's, uh, you're much better off being able to address, adjust address that issue, uh, on a race morning, as opposed to, uh, being out there on the side of the road during the race. So, um, I, I would say don't necessarily inflate your tires when you drop it off, wait till race morning to inflate them, but there's no need to, to deflate them overnight. And then don't cover your saddle. Uh, you'll see that a lot. Um, uh, plastic bags or seat covers. Uh, sometimes the cover, the handlebars one, you're out in the desert. So it's chances are it's going to stay dry overnight. But even if it doesn't, uh, if, if in the off chance there is humidity or, or the rare occurrence of getting rain in the desert, your bike is going to be just fine. That, uh, saddle and handlebars are, <clears throat> are made, uh, to, to be wet. Absolutely no risk there. So that's just one more thing to do. One more thing to keep up with, uh, one more action. That's just not productive for race day. Speaking of, let's get to it. On to the swim. So water temperature will be announced prior to the swim start. The official water temperature will be taking uh, be taken early uh, in the, the wee hours of, of race day. It will be announced um, on the loudspeakers as you're setting up your transition area. Uh, sometimes they do a push notification through the app or post to social media to, so you'll know exactly what that water temperature is going to be. They will also be taking measurements in the days leading into the race, so you'll have a real good idea of what that water temperature is going to be. Uh, last year, the official water temperature was 62.7. Um, there, there were reports that it was actually closer to, to 60, maybe even in the upper fifties. It was quite cold last year. Um, 2021 official water temperature is 66.2, um, 64 in 2019. So basically what we can expect is somewhere in that neighborhood of the low sixties. So it is wetsuit legal up to and including 76.1. Um, there is, is almost no chance that, uh, that's going to be an issue. So count on a, a wetsuit swim. Uh, the, um, more relevant thing that, that can come into question, uh, are our booties. So those are allowed below 65 degrees. So if the water is 64.9 
or below, you are able to, to wear booties. Now, in most cases, booties are going to make you slower. There's not a, um, an advantage to wearing booties. Um, for that reason, gloves are prohibited. Iron Man does not allow gloves at any temperature. Um, so unless you have like a, a condition like Renaud's and you can actually get a, a, an exemption from the race director, um, gloves are prohibited. Booties are allowed. Gloves are, um, prohibited because they are, uh, an aid to your swim. However, booties are, are not. So, um, chances are if you wear those booties, they're going to slow you down some. So take that into consideration if you need them, if you have, uh, again, Renaud's or something like that, uh, or, or you're concerned with things like hypothermia or just being excessively cold. Um, if the water is below 65, those booties are an option. Uh, age group start at 650. It is a self-seated rolling start, which means you will line up right outside the transition area. Uh, they have a, a, a singular long corral uh, that you will line up according to your expected swim time. There will be volunteers there holding up signs um, with, I, b- I believe the first sign is 60 minutes and below. And then from there, it's like every 10 minutes. So uh, one to 110, 110 to 120, all the way back to two hours plus. So you will be lining up with uh, fellow athletes that are are a, having an expected swim time similar to yours. Um, we are going back uh, several years, which I think is is a good thing um, to to what used to be uh, the the swim start headed down a temporary staircase that is set up right outside the transition area. The last several years, they've used some of the boat ramps, uh, which, which have caused just some logistical issues and longer transitions, longer walks, um, in the morning. So I think this is a, uh, a good thing that they are returning back to, uh, the stair. Something new, uh, is a floating dock exit. So, um, you will exit just shy of the staircase. So, uh, this, this image here is not, uh, the actual swim exit, uh, but this is a an example of what that floating dock uh, will will look like. So it's it's kind of like uh, the staircase, but they'll be submerged. There'll be volunteers helping you out of the water. So a couple of tips for the swim start um, for those that are concerned with this colder water, um, especially consider neoprene neoprene cap. Uh, those often will um, cover the ears and strap under the chin. Um, that can sometimes, uh, cause some issues, especially if you're, you're kind of claustrophobic in a wetsuit make sure that you're practicing with this prior to race day. So, um, the other thing you can do is wear a, a latex, uh, swim cap under the silicone cap that they will give you. Those latex caps are, are thicker. They're going to help you, uh, retain some of that heat. Uh, you do lose a lot of heat through your scalp. And obviously that's uh, going to be the leading edge of, of what is hitting that, uh, that probably 60 to 65 degree water. Um, so to take that into consideration, um, earplugs is another option. Keeping that cold water out of your ears has a physiological, um, effect. Uh, and then if you're, another thing you can do is, uh, put Vaseline or, or Aquaphor, something like that, um, on your face, a lot of times having that cold water hit your face is really what is going to trigger that fight or flight response. Um, Vaseline or, or something like that um, is provides just a very thin barrier uh, between that cold water and your skin. So it can help uh, alleviate some of that. So especially if you're wearing a, a full sleeve suit at that point, basically it's your hands and feet or just your hands if you're wearing the booties. So all of this is going to depend on one, the water temperature and two, your tolerance for, for cold water and how concerned are you with those effects. So when it comes time to get uh, into that um, self-seated rolling start, I recommend getting down there early. Those corrals fill up. Um, they get very crowded, very dense. Uh, if you get down there late, it's going to be very difficult for you to uh, maneuver your way up to where you want to be, especially uh, the faster you are, the more difficult it's going to be, the more people you're going to have to uh, uh, work your way through. And uh, there's a good chance that you're not going to be where you want to be. And that's not a great way to start uh, the day. So head down there early, get set up and um, 
get down there uh, with plenty of time. Don't queue slower than expected. So this is something else we see. It's like, well, maybe I'm a 130 swimmer, but I'm going to hang back 145, 150 because I'm a little timid, a little scared. Or I've got uh, my 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 friend, my training partner, they're swimming 150. So I'm going to start back with them. Um, inevitably, what's going to happen is you are going to increase the amount of contact uh, that you have with the other swimmers. Um, so swimming with athletes that are of like pace is going to reduce, not eliminate, but reduce the amount of contact, the, uh, the amount of people that you're swimming over, the amount of people swimming over you, the better we do this, the better it is for, for everyone. Um, and then this is one of my favorite tips. My good buddy, Jeff Rains, uh, taught me this years ago, and this can be, um, I, I would say the water is likely cold enough for everyone, uh, to take advantage of this. So this is probably my top tip for the first half of, of our time here this evening. Prime your wetsuit. Now, uh, yep. Uh, pretty much everybody's going to pee in their wetsuit and this is going to go a long way in doing that. Uh, that's going to work on the, uh, waist down. Um, but we want to get the, uh, upper portion of, of your wetsuit primed as well. So recommendation here is to bring some, um, room temperature water with you down there to the swim start. So go, go down there early, get queued up. And then I would say about 10 minutes prior to your swim start, pour that water down your suit. Uh, the way that wetsuit works is again, it's a wetsuit. It is not a dry suit. Um, so it is, it is not intended to keep you dry. Um, it works by warming a thin layer of water between that neoprene and your body. So your body is actually the heat source here. And that neoprene is what keeps it warm. So if you are jumping into that water and say it's 62 degrees, you are now going to have to, uh, utilize body heat to warm that water up. Um, which is actually going to um, pull heat from your body. It's going to make you colder uh, in the start. So um, by by priming the suit, getting that water in prior to the start, one, it's going to be warmer than the water that you're jumping into. And two, you're going to have some time for your body to, to warm it up. So um, once there, you've got that thin uh, layer of water already there. So you're off to, to the races, literally. Um, so again, it, it's usually maybe two, three water bottles, uh, maybe one bigger jug you can share with your friends and just get as much of that water down. It's going to be cold. It's going to be a little bit of a shock, but so is that water that you're going to hit a few minutes later. So just a great way to, to get started and then settle in, get some sink downs in. If you're concerned about the water temperature or, or even just the chaos of the swim, uh, taking a, a little bit of time early on to get comfortable is going to pay dividends later on. You're better off taking 30 seconds, a minute, two minutes, um, hanging out there around the stairs and, and just splashing some cold water on your face, getting comfortable with that water temperature instead of just jumping in and then having a panic attack, hundred, 200 yards in. Um, so do what you need to do, uh, to, to be comfortable. So headed out onto the swim course. It is, uh, it is, it is built as a new course, um, which it's, it's not exactly a new course. It's uh, kind of a throwback to, uh, the courses of, of several years ago. Again, I think this is an improvement. The water is, is fully protected. So as you can see here from the map, uh, it is not a large body of water. It is basically a man-made pond, uh, with dams on, on either end. So, uh, there's, there's no current, uh, there are no waves. Um, the, um, the worst we're going to experience is some surface chop. So, um, it, it is known to be windy out there in the desert. If it's a windy day, there will be some chop on the water, but, uh, that's about it. Uh, it is entirely or, or almost entirely in a east and west direction. So, uh, initially you're headed out there to the west, make the U-turn head back, headed to the west. So that first portion of the swim is going to be into the sunrise. So that, uh, is, is going to be relevant. And there's low water quality. So, uh, this is not, uh, low water clarity. There's, there's, um, it, it's murky, it's muddy. Um, so you're not going to be able to see a whole lot in it. Um, but, uh, you know, just know that, uh, yeah, you're, you'll be able to see outside the water, but, uh, underwater, there's not a whole lot to see down there and, uh, you're not gonna be able to see it anyway. All right. A couple tips for the swim course because of that, uh, sunrise, uh, definitely recommend having mirrored or dark goggles. Uh, it is important to sight often. Uh, the, the thing you can do to extend your swim, 
uh, is to swim extra yards. Uh, best way to swim extra yards is to swim crooked. Uh, best way to swim crooked is to not sight often enough. So remedy all that by sighting often. Uh, my recommendation is to begin sighting at a higher rate uh, than, than maybe expected. And once you get used to it, once you find yourself every time you're sighting, you're right on target, right on line, you're not having to make any adjustments, then you can begin to extend that time between um, taking sights. Then if you reach a point where uh, you are having to make those adjustments, dial that back and begin sighting more often uh, as well. So find that sweet spot where you're, you're sighting frequently enough to not have to be making large course corrections. Uh, use the bridges and the buildings uh, as well as the bank. So again, you're never that far away from uh, the, the bank. There are plenty of tall buildings. There are these bridges that are very iconic. So there are lots of things to help with that. So even if you're not necessarily looking straight ahead, uh, sighting off a buoy or something on the, the forward horizon, you can be looking to the side, the, the banks and the buildings on the side there to ensure that you're, you're maintaining maintaining your space, um, even just as you're breathing uh, to, to the side. Break the course into segments. So swimming 2.4 miles is daunting. Uh, racing 140.6 miles is even more daunting. So it's, it's uh, a great strategy to break it down into sections. Um, for some, it may be the red turn buoys. So get across the lake and then make it to that next turn buoy. Then you've got a little victory because you don't have to go that far. And then you've got that closing stretch. Uh, for a lot, it's buoy to buoy. That's really my focus and my concentration. When I'm attacking an Ironman swim, all I'm worried about is getting to that first buoy. And then when I'm at that first buoy, it's the second buoy and so on and so forth. Next thing you know, I'm headed out of the water and into transition. One thing that is going to be absolutely important for those, uh, especially on the, uh, the, the back half of the finish, um, it is going to be very important to stay moving. Um, last year, uh, when those water temperatures were give or take 60 degrees, there were quite a few athletes that were, um, if not hypothermic, they were close. They were very cold. They lost a lot of body temperature. And a lot of that had to do with time where they were not generating body heat. Um, if you stop and hang on to the kayak, obviously do that if you need to, but you are going to be losing uh, body heat at a, at a fairly rapid pace while doing that. So the more you can move, the more generate that body heat, the better off you're going to be, the warmer you're going to be when you exit the swim. So as you are able to uh, keep moving, obviously, if you need to hang on to the kayak and, and get um, assistance or anything like that, obviously do that, but minimize that time as you are able. The more time you spend swimming, uh, the better off you're going to be both from your time perspective, as well as, uh, hoping to avoid um, the cold. All right, headed into transition one. Uh, so you will exit the the water uh, kind of right there by that famous iconic Mill Avenue bridge. And this is my, my guess as to what transitioning is going to look like uh, from the past 10 years or so. Um, so you'll start there at that green dot um, and uh, follow that red line and head way up here, almost to the uh, kind of the main drag there. So um, you'll kind of, this will, this will all be marked and it'll be, you'll be funneled, uh, with barricades that'll send you up here. So you'll come up, uh, you'll make a U-turn and then that's where your bike gear bags are going to be staged. You're going to drop those off the day before, um, and you'll pick up your bag. You will head into the change tent, which is that white oval. Uh, that is where it has always been located. So I'm assuming it's going to be there as well. Uh, you will change, uh, in the change tent or transition in the change tent, whatever it is that you you are doing in transition. You will repack your swim gear into that bag. So your wetsuit, your goggles, swim cap, all of that will go back into that run gear bag. Uh, you will then drop that bag on your way out. Um, in some races this year, they have been instructing the athletes to take that bag with you and drop it at your, your bike rack. But you will either drop it there in the transition area, uh, in, in the change tent, outside the change tent, or, or at your bike rack. But they will instruct you um, exactly what to do with, um, with that bike. And then head through that blue area uh, that is the, the bike uh, transition area, head to bike out, which is on the west side, um, and then head out. The mount line is generally pretty early on, and then you will be riding your bike out of the park uh, via what was the uh, most of the village expo area. So in the days leading into the race, this is where all the um, exhibitors, all those tents are, are going to be set up. So that is actually going to become the very beginning and very end of the uh, bike course on race day. It, it is barricaded as well uh, with monitored crosswalks. So don't have to worry about uh, too much traffic or anything like that. From there, 
uh, you will head out onto the bike course. A couple tips for transition one, mark your bag. Um, so there are 3000 other bags that look exactly like yours. The only thing that is going to distinguish yours from thousands of others that look exactly like it is a sticker. I have seen numerous times where this sticker has come off. If that sticker comes off, there is nothing to differentiate your bag from the thousands of others that look exactly like it. So before you put your sticker on that bag, my recommendation is to use a Sharpie and to write your number in the little box where it says to put that sticker. And then I say go nuts and write your number all over that bag so you know exactly which one is yours. And then even take it a step further. My tip here is to get some kind of fun, bright novelty duct tape. Uh, you can get it on Amazon, Walmart, Walgreens, someplace like that. And just tear off uh, 12 to 18 inch strips and just post it there on your bag. Uh, it's going to make your bag stand out. You'll recognize it immediately, um, which will just uh, help alleviate uh, your time finding your bag, getting your bag, um, uh, so, so to speak. Um, so do something there again to make your bag, nothing that is going to interfere with, uh, other people's bags, volunteers, no streamers, balloons, anything like that. But I I've literally given this advice to thousands of athletes, never had any issues with, uh, with the duct tape, uh, know your locations. This is going to start with your bag. So you're going to be dropping that bag off, um, on, on Saturday, the day before the race, you will have access to the bags typically, um, on a race morning. So if you need to drop any, uh, nutrition or anything like that, you can ac access that bag. There's a good chance that that bag is going to be in a slightly different place on Sunday morning than where you left it Saturday afternoon, because the volunteers are going to go in and they're going to neaten things up. So, um, there's a whole lot of bags to fit in this area. Um, and if you're the first person, um, which, I kind of recommend to be, uh, you're, you're going to, it's going to be in a little different spot because everybody's going to come. They're going to drop their bags. They're going to get moved around a little bit, but, um, volunteers do a great job of organizing it. But again, if you've got that tape on your bag, you're going to know exactly which one is yours. It's going to be super easy, uh, to spot once you come through, uh, be efficient and pack minimally, kind of putting these two together. So, um, everything that you are going to have for the bike, um, that is not, uh, kind of permanently affixed to your bike is going to be in that bike gear bag. The one thing you absolutely have to have in that bike gear bag is a helmet because one, you have to have a helmet and two, that helmet cannot be on your bike at the rack. Um, you can have bottles and your nutrition gels, all that, uh, kind of stowed on your bike, but nothing, um, loose or around, uh, your bike, everything else has to go in this bag. So, um, be efficient and pack minimally, nothing that uh, you don't have to have in there because space is limited and you're on the clock here. So we want to move through this as efficiently as possible. Practice in advance. You may be a, a highly seasoned athlete that has done uh, 50, 70.3s and 100 short course races and you're a ninja in transition, but Ironman transition is different. So make sure you know what's in that bag, what order you are going to be doing everything in that bag and be efficient in that. So one, you can move through as quickly as possible. And two, you don't forget anything, which is probably more important than even how quickly um, you are able to, to get through there. And then consider a go bottle. Uh, this is another one of my top tips. This is credit to my friends at Precision Fuel and Hydration. This is something I incorporated several years ago and, and I really firmly believe in it. Um, so here we go, drinking game. It again, it is absolutely critical to remain hydrated uh, throughout the race. Uh, over the past hour to two hours, as you've been out there on the swim, hopefully you have not taken in too much hydration. So uh, you've been losing hydration during that time um, and you're going to need it as you head out there onto the bike course. That go bottle is where I mentioned before, I use, um, I drink vitamin water in the days leading into the race. Not only do I like the vitamin water or product, but the bottle makes a great go bottle. So what I will do um, in the is as I'm preparing my bags uh, prior to the race, I will save two of those vitamin water bottles. For T1, I will put about six to eight ounces of water in there, and then I will do a serving of my nutrition, a serving of my electrolytes. So this is just gonna be a quick chug as I'm in that changing tent, get that uh, little bit of water, get some calories, get some electrolytes in. That's going to make up for all of those that I burned while out there on the swim, and it's gonna prime uh, everything and help me get started with those protocols as I head out onto the bike. So it's just a quick, um, quick drink there to, to get those off and going. All right, out onto the bike course. So it is a three loop course. Um, 
I, I actually like that. I, I'm a big fan of it. Uh, I think it makes execution and management uh, really, really easy. Uh, so big fan of the multi-loop course. Generally good row conditions. They're not perfect. Um, and actually the, uh, I would say the, the newer, nicer roads, those that are, are in closer to town around the, uh, the stadium and, and, um, to the South of, of the, um, of the lake, those actually have some, some bigger cracks and, and are bumpier. Once you get down to the B line, um, generally pretty good roads. I mean, again, this is not a, a velodrome by any means, but, uh, very manageable, certainly not going to, uh, cause you major problems and, and they're going to be fast enough. So generally good road conditions. Uh, the first half of the course is, is basically pancake flat. Uh, the second half is a net uphill. Um, these are not big climbs, um, but kind of, again, depending on your definition, uh, there is a, a little bit of elevation gain in the second half of the bike course. Uh, the good thing is uh, that is reversed on the way back. So uh, the the first half of your return trip to transition uh, is a net downhill, and then it flattens out at the end, three loop course, you will do all those three times. So really, uh, again, pretty, pretty pancake flat for the first 15 miles. And then miles 15 to 19 um, is an average of a 1% grade with 200 feet of elevation gain in that, uh, in that four mile stretch. So, uh, you can see there on the map kind of where, where mile 15 is. Um, and, uh, that, that is where, uh, we see this peak down there at the bottom. You can see the elevation chart. You can see there's a slight increase, uh, over the first couple, but then kind of all of a sudden there's, there's a steeper, uh, rise in that elevation chart. And you can see that basically represents those last four miles as you head from mile 15 to the turnaround. Uh, and again, great news is, uh, what goes up comes back down. So, uh, you have a nice steep smoking fast, uh, segment for, for four miles as you begin your return back into Tempe. Uh, there's not a whole lot, uh, other than cactus out here on this course. It is fully exposed to the sun and to the wind. So again, you're out in the desert, pretty good chance. Uh, there's going to be a decent amount of sun. Um, I thought that the first time I raced back in 2015 and it rained all day. So, um, it, it is pretty rare to get, uh, that much rain in the desert. Um, it happened once, so it probably won't happen again, but you never know. Uh, so, so kind of count on, um, a sunny day. And uh, again, it's hard to predict how much wind we're going to have this far out. Uh, there have been some calm years, but most years there has been a, a certain amount of, of wind out there. Other than the distance, the wind is the most difficult component of this course to, to deal with. It is not the elevation gain. It is not a, any technical aspect of the course. It's the wind that is going to um, make this course as difficult as, as it is. There may not be any. Uh, it could be very difficult, kind of just depending on, on whatever the wind is on the day. Uh, personal needs bags are available for the first time at mile 23. So you'll make that U-turn. You'll basically come down that hill uh, and, and right about where it starts to flatten out. That is where you'll have access to your personal needs bags. You have the option of taking those bags uh, on any of the three loops, but you will only be able to, able to take it once. So if you access that personal needs bag on the first loop, it will not be available on the second and third. So, uh, so, so uh, from from there. Couple tips for the bike course: settle into the loops and build throughout. Uh, you're you're probably going to be real excited. Uh, you had a great swim, uh, and you're going to head out onto this flat, fast course. Uh, make sure you're not going out too hard. This is a uh, long course, 112 miles. You're going to be out there uh, for a long time, so settle into the loops and build throughout. And that's one thing I really like about the way this course sets up, it is very easy to break into segments. So obviously you have the three loops, you have six out and backs, and, and that's really where um, I, I tend to focus on this. Uh, it's a 19 mile stretch from transition to the U-turn point. 19 miles at this point in your training is just an easy recovery ride. You can ride 19 miles in your sleep. So approach it that way. It's just 19 miles at a time. It's not 112 miles. I'm riding from transition to that turnaround. And then I'm riding from that turnaround back to transition. And, and I'm going to do that two more times. If I've done it once, I can do it again. I've done it twice. I can do it once more. Uh, you can even break this down into um, even further segments 
where you are going from transition to the beeline and then from the beeline to the uh, U-turn. So um, the uh, what I'll refer to as the uh, urban uh, downtown side um, is a little bit shorter. Uh, so again, it's, it's about 19 miles from transition to the U-turn. Um, I, I believe it's around seven to eight miles of, of going through the, the urban area where we have some turns or some buildings, stoplights, all that kind of stuff. Obviously those are going to be controlled by police officers, not to worry about those. But then once you hit the B line, um, the B line is actually a divided highway. So you have northbound traffic on, on one side, uh, divided. And then the other, they actually close, uh, one side of that highway for race day. So, uh, what is usually a, a one way becomes two way traffic. So, uh, the great thing is there are no vehicles on the beeline section of the, of the highway, but there are going to be lots and lots of bikes out there. So, uh, break the course down into segments, three loops, six, 19 mile segments, or even 12, uh, shorter segments than that. Just uh, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time, approach it, um, celebrate the little victories and move on to the next. Keep in mind the rule of reciprocity. So what goes up comes back down. Uh, so as you are grinding out and going slow uh, on those last four miles of this stretch, uh, know that you're going to be screaming down uh, that, that same hill as once you make that U-turn. Um, this is perhaps even a bigger thing um, when, when we're talking about the wind. Um, so if you are fighting a headwind, uh, which a lot of times the outbound section will be into the wind, uh, know that uh, not only will you get to enjoy a net down downhill on the way back, but that tailwind is going to be pushing you. Same thing. If you are feeling a tailwind, if you're riding faster than you should be, uh, on, on your way out on that outbound segment, uh, keep that in mind and know that you're going to have to kind of pay the piper when you make that U-turn and that wind that has been pushing you now, uh, you're going to have to overcome. So what goes up, comes back down, tailwinds become uh, headwinds. So just keep that in mind. Remember to stretch. So this is a great course for riding in the air position uh, for the vast majority of the course. If you are from an area that uh, you, you've got a lot of turns or a lot of climbs uh, and you spend a lot of time out of the air position, either, either navigating technical areas or up out of the saddle uh, climbing, um, your back, neck, shoulders may get fatigued uh, if you are staying in that air position longer than normal. So make sure uh, you are taking some opportunities as you're going through the aid stations, as you're approaching these U-turns, make sure to sit up, stretch, um, and take care of your back, neck, and shoulders. Be mindful of the crowds. As I mentioned, there are going to be a whole lot of bikes out here on this course. This is the, the biggest disadvantage, I would say, of a three loop course where normally if it's a, it's a one loop 112 mile course, uh, those 3000 athletes are able to get very spread out. Um, that's not the case here. Uh, you've got a whole lot of athletes that are going to be on the same course. It gets very crowded. So one, make sure that, uh, you are, are prioritizing your safety and the safety of those around you. And then also make sure that you are following the rules, maintaining those draft links, um, passing when you enter into, uh, that draft zone, you allow others to pass when you are overtaken, you drop back and reestablish that draft zone. Uh, there, there's a lot of officials out there. Uh, they don't have to, uh, patrol as many miles. Um, so, uh, they're going to be out there as they should be. So make sure that you are aware uh, of it. So, so it's, it's kind of like a big group ride. Um, but, uh, make sure that you are again, staying safe and following the rules. Stay ahead on hydration and nutrition. So take a shot there. Here we go again. Uh, it's, it's absolutely critical that you nail your hydration and nutrition on the bike. Yes, you need hydration and nutrition on the bike, but when you really are able to tell how well you did in execution of your nutrition, hydration, electrolytes is out there on the run. This is where, uh, kind of the rent comes due. You, uh, likely can, can not do real well with executing your, um, hydration and nutrition protocol on the bike and still successfully complete the bike leg and maybe have a great bike leg. Um, but when you, uh, get vertical and bipedal and, and you're out there, uh, running, that's when you're going to know that's when, uh, it's going to be very obvious whether you nailed your hydration and nutrition or whether, uh, you didn't, if you overdid it, this is where you're going to have GI issues, stomach ache, all those kinds of things. If you under fueled, under hydrated, uh, you're going to have issues there. Um, as well. So, uh, keep in mind that, uh, you, you are not, um, 
going to be sweating in the same way that uh, perhaps, especially if you, again, if you're training in a humid um, area, uh, you, where you're, you basically stay wet because you're sweating. Um, this is not going to be the case out there in the desert. So don't be fooled just because you're not wet. You don't feel sweaty. That doesn't mean you're not losing hydration. In fact, you are very likely losing hydration at a faster rate um, than at home. So make sure that uh, you are drinking like it's your job because it is. In addition to that, uh, also a very important thing is to stay cool. Um, this can also be a bit deceiving one, because your sweat is working very efficiently in cooling your body, but, um, there in the desert is, it's very likely going to be, uh, pretty cool in the morning. Uh, last time I looked at the forecast, uh, an hour or so ago, it's showing, uh, overnight temperatures around 50 degrees. So pretty, pretty cool by my standards. Chances are it's going to be in the sixties, um, on the bike. So I always say a, a cool to cold bike sets up a good run. If you're comfortable on the bike, that means it's going to be a hot run. Um, but that said, you're going to be out there for, uh, five, six, seven hours. You've been in the water for an hour to two hours. You've been exercising now for six, seven, eight hours. You've been generating body heat. Um, and now you're out there in the desert and you're going to be headed out onto that run course when the, um, temperature is at its highest. Uh, basically we're looking at temperatures somewhere in the upper seventies to low eighties, um, with full sun that is going to get warm. Um, especially again, given the fact that you've got six, seven, eight hours of, of body temperature generation going on here. So just like your hydration and nutrition protocols, it is critical to stay cool on the bike so you can set yourself up for a good run. You may not feel hot, um, out there on the bike course, but once you begin that run and all of a sudden for, for whatever reason, you just can't run, uh, there's a good chance you're dehydrated, you're low on fuel or your body is, is overheated. So make sure, uh, to, to stay up on your cooling protocols. Uh, my, my recommendation here is to take a water bottle every opportunity that you get. So, um, you go through those aid stations, they're going to have cool water bottles. Uh, the first thing I do when I go through an aid station is, uh, I will take a big chug of that cold water and then I will spray my face, spray my back, my body, get as much as my kit wet with that cold water. Um, so what I'm doing there is looking to control my core temperature, both internally and externally. So drinking the cold water and then using that cold water, um, to, to pour over my body before I head out of that, um, trash zone. I will usually do that again. Another big chug of water, I'll uh, spray my, um, my face and my body again, and I'll, I'll either ditch that bottle, uh, in the trash zone, or, uh, I may stow it away if I have a cage and I want to carry that water bottle with me. If you're using the on course nutrition, I always recommend taking a fresh bottle because the bottle you have is not going to be as cold as that one that they're handing you. That cold Gatorade is going to be more palatable. So you're more likely to drink more of it. And again, that's going to help control your core temperature from the inside. Now, um, I talked about being hypothermic or really cold on the swim. So this is something to, to kind of gauge as the day goes on. So maybe on that first outbound stretch, um, maybe you're not so concerned about this, but, um, by the second or third lap, um, you're going to have warmed up, uh, regardless of how cold you were on the swim, um, so now this is, is going to be an issue and, and it may become full circle where you were uh, borderline hypothermic on the swim, but now we're concerned with controlling our core temperature out on the bike. So very important, uh, to, to nail these things. Um, so execution is really what race day is about. And I will say the most important things of your race day execution is your pacing, hydration, nutrition, and your cooling. So make sure that you are, um, highly aware of all those. You've got a plan and race day is all about execution. As you complete that third loop, you're screaming downhill, uh, headed back into transition for the last time, begin to prepare for T2 and the run. So um, my recommendation here is, is maybe a little bit um, counterintuitive to everything I've said. Um, around mile 105, 106, uh, I will stop taking in uh, anything. I don't drink or eat anything in those last couple of minutes. So the reason for that is I want to allow my stomach to empty in that last 20 minutes or so, so that when I head out onto that run course, my stomach isn't full of fluids or food sloshing around, uh, causing a stomach ache, any discomfort like that. So the last 20 minutes, I allow my stomach to empty. Um, so uh, at, at 
30 to 25 minutes out, I want to make sure that I am, I am fully topped off. I'm good to go. I'm, I'm all caught up. I've got my hydration, nutrition, my electrolytes are all good. And then I can afford to take that 20 minute break as I navigate those last, uh, five, six, seven miles into transition. The other thing I'm going to do is match my cadence on the bike to my run cadence. So late in an Ironman, uh, bike leg, I am likely somewhere in the 75 to 80 RPM, uh, range coming back down, uh, that net downhill, um, grinding those bigger gears, 75 to 80 RPM is, is where I will land personally. When I come out of transition out there on the run course, I want to have a, a run cadence closer to 90, uh, steps per minute per foot. So what I'm going to do is, especially once the thing, uh, once the course flattens out, I'm going to back off a gear or two where I can maintain my power, but I want my cadence closer to 85 to 90. I'm going to generally, uh, or, or gradually build that uh, over those closing miles so that when I head into T2, uh, those last several minutes, I've been spending at 90, uh, RPMs. And what that's going to do is establish that brain body connection so that when I come out of transition, um, my body's going to pick up right off where, where we left off. And I will then naturally settle in very easily to, to my run cadence of approximately 90 steps per minute. But if you've been out there at, at uh, uh, 60, 70, 80, uh, RPM on the bike for, five, six hours, uh, chances are that's the cadence you're going to be at, uh, when you start the run course, which, um, quite likely is, is too low. So, um, as you approach the end of that, make sure that you are, um, adjusting. All right. As you head into T2, uh, you will ride up the ramp back through the village. Uh, you will hand off your bike to a volunteer. So this is kind of like that VIP service. Um, so you'll hit that dismount line, hand your bike off, and you're, you're probably not going to be, uh, real anxious to see that bike again for a little bit, but they'll take good care of it for you. Uh, hand it off to a volunteer. You will retrieve your run gear bag. Uh, so you can see where, where those will likely be located there where that bag icon is. You'll head into the change tent, transition as needed, repack your bike gear into that run bag. So your helmet and everything else that's not going with you out onto that run course, you'll pack into um, that run gear bag, drop it in the designated area, and then proceed out onto the run course. Tips for T2 look a whole lot like the tips for T1. Uh, be efficient, pack minimally, practice in advance, and consider a go bottle. The big di biggest difference here, uh, T1 to T2 on my go bottle, instead of six to eight ounces of water, I'm more like 10 to 12, uh, simply because in T1, I'm not going to take that bottle with me. In T2, I can. I may take down that full uh, 10, 12 ounces as I'm uh, going through my, my gear bag, um, but maybe my stomach isn't quite as uh, as as feeling as great as I'd hoped it would. Uh, maybe I'm just not up for it yet. Um, so I can take that bottle with me as needed. So, um, I haven't taken anything in, in the past 20 minutes. My stomach is empty. So taking in 10 to 12 ounces, uh, in transition is, is no problem, uh, for, for me, my stomach, um, can handle it. And it's just, again, great way to, uh, prime the start of the run with hydration, nutrition, and electrolytes. So I can head out on to the run. Run is a two loop course. Uh, it is mostly path. Uh, some of that path is unpaved. Basically, uh, what I would refer to as the Southeast uh, quadrant of this course has a section right there along the water uh, that is crushed gravel. Uh, you don't need trail shoes or anything like that. You're absolutely fine running in your vapor flies or whatever it is. Uh, that you're going to be running in, um, on this course, but vast majority of it, uh, is, is path. Um, some of it is road. Some of it is, um, the, the gravel, but, uh, it, it's a great course, great, uh, services, nothing to worry about that. Like the bike, mostly exposed to the sun. Um, so the one thing you have here is there, there are some tall buildings along a lot of, of the course that can provide some shade depending on the time of day. But uh, again, be ready for uh, lots of time out in the sun. It is mostly flat, uh, again, kind of depending on your definition. Uh, if you live in an area, run in an area that has any amount of elevation, you will call this course completely flat. Uh, if like me, you come from uh, Pancakeville, uh, there are a couple places here where you, yeah, you will gain some elevation, but nothing uh, too significant. Um, the, the most significant change in elevation is that northernmost 
um, stretch of the course, uh, just shy of, of mile 10. Uh, once you go up to that northernmost point and you uh, make a left turn, um, that is a, a small climb. Um, and then right there where that uh, mile 10 marker is, that is an even faster descent. Uh, you'll, you'll come screaming down uh, quite quickly into what has historically been uh, one of the coolest uh, and most entertaining aid stations right there under the freeway. But um, again, vast majority of the course, pancake flat. Personal needs are available at the start of the loop. So basically, as soon as you come under that Mill Avenue bridge, your personal needs bags will be there on the right. So uh, again, hopefully you're not needing those uh, on your first loop because you're only about 100 yards into the course. Uh, but right at that 13 mile mark, starting the second loop, your bag uh, will be available. Um, keep in mind, uh, we have already surpassed the time change. It's uh, uh, This course is is lit to a degree, but there are also sections of the course that do get dark. So if you're going to be out there uh, later into the evening and into the nighttime hours, maybe consider a headlamp, something like that. It will get dark and it will get dark early. All right. A couple of tips for the run course. Like everything else, break the course into sections. Eat this elephant one bite at a time. One of my favorite references here, uh, one thing I really like about this course is that iconic Mill Avenue bridge. Everything circulates around that. You're never more than two miles away from that Mill Avenue bridge. In fact, your very first segment is the furthest you ever are away from that bridge. So you come out running there to uh, to the east on the south side of, of the river. Um, you run two miles and you turn around and you come back to the bridge. And then you run about a mile and a half down to Priest you cross over and you run about a mile and a half back to the bridge. And then same thing out there. Uh, it's, it's about a mile and a half out there to where that mile eight marker is. And then you run back towards that bridge. So it's just a great reference to, to be able to break the course down. Don't worry about running a marathon. Don't come out of T2 thinking about having to run 26.2 miles, run that mile or two miles, uh, at, at the very beginning. So maybe it's, um, the, the first little bridge you'll come to is about a mile down. Uh, the U-turns at two miles. So just focus on that. Just get to that two mile U-turn and then run another two miles back to the bridge and then run over to Priest and then run across the river. Break it down into manageable sections and celebrate the victories along the way. Also, like everything else, ease in and build throughout. Uh, if you're feeling fantastic, great. Don't blow it. Uh, make sure and manage that energy, manage that feeling for as long as possible. You want to maintain that feeling great as long as possible. So if you look down and you're running 20, 30, 60 seconds faster than you thought, chances are that's not going to last. It's it's fairly common to come out of transition feeling really good, but unfortunately it doesn't last. So rein it back in, stick to your plan and execute what you know is going to set you up for success. Stay hydrated, stay cool, take your shots. There we go. Uh, once again, you're out here running in the desert. You've been exercising now for uh, 8, 10, 12, 14 hours. You have burned through a lot of hydration. Make sure that you are staying drinking. Um, and at the same time, make sure that you are staying cool, especially in the daylight air, uh, daytime um, hours. And then take something from every aid station. So one, you paid a whole bunch of money to be in this race, might as well get your money's worth. But at the same time, there's a very good chance that you can benefit from something at every aid station. These aid stations are approximately uh, every mile, mile and a half uh, spaced apart. So uh, you either are due for some water, some calories, um, or, uh, to, to even cool from the outside. So maybe, especially when that sun is high, uh, pouring water over your head, pouring water over your body to, to stay cool. Um, so again, chances are you need something from every aid station. So plan that out as you're approaching. What do I need? Do I need hydration? Do I need calories? Do I need, uh, maybe to mix it up and, and do maybe a different gel, caffeinated gel. Maybe it's some fruit, salt from the pretzels, something like that. Determine what you need and then utilize those aid stations. And then also use your personal needs strategically. So is it um, a, a long sleeve shirt or a jacket? Um, if, if you're going to be out there and the temperature is going to begin to, to drop, uh, maybe it's a headlamp, maybe it's um, a, a treat or, or, or something like that to, to break up the monotony of all the nutrition you've been taking in all day. Maybe it's a note uh, from your, your kids or, or your partner, wh whatever it is you need. Uh, take advantage of that personal need bag and use that strategically. All right. Last stretch, the finish. 
This is what it is all about. I get goosebumps now, even thinking about it, talking about it. Uh, again, I've had the privilege of crossing that finish line in Arizona uh, twice. I am a 10-time Ironman finisher. And what is going to bring me back for my 11th time is experiencing this magic finish line. If you've been there, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If not, you are in for something truly amazing. So this is probably my top tip for all of our time here this evening. Take in the finish line and enjoy it. Don't rush it. Don't miss out on it. So as you, um, w- one of the slight modifications to the run course this year is you will not uh, run near uh, the, the finish line um, as you're making the loop. Uh, in years past, you got pretty close to it. Now you've got, um, I don't know, maybe a quarter mile to a half mile where it's going to be just finishers on that stretch. So as you uh, bypass that place where you turned off to start your second loop, um, previously, think about that. Now you're almost there. You're done. You're going to make it really start to enjoy it and take it in. And then when you make that turn and you can see the finish line, you're stepping onto that red carpet, you're hearing the announcer be fully present. Um, if you're close to making a cutoff or you're seconds away from a PR or a Kona qualification, by all means, get across that finish line. But if you've got 10 seconds, 20 seconds to spare, I would encourage you and um, tell you, advise you that that would be time well spent uh, just to really enjoy your time in that finishing shoot and on that red carpet. Be present, listen for your name to be called. Um, and then from there, clean it up. This is going to be your, uh, your finisher picture is going to be your Instagram profile, your Christmas card and everything else for the next several years. Uh, plan your finish, have fun with it. Uh, obviously, Um, can't take kids or anything like that across the finish line with you. This is your time, uh, but, uh, enjoy it. Find some space. If, uh, um, you're coming in with a crowd of other folks, uh, maybe just hang back, let them go and have their moment. Um, or if you've made a best friend and you guys ran the last 20 miles together, by all means, uh, lock arms and cross that finish line together. And then for me, it's all the high fives. There are kids, strangers, your support crew and loved ones. They've got their hands out for me. Uh, One of my favorite things to do is run down an Ironman finish line and give out all the high fives. All right, guys, that's what I've got. Um, I I am already a little bit over time. um, So I've I've got some questions here. I'm going to hit a couple uh, real quick because these are some pretty common ones. If I'm not able to answer your question uh, here this evening, I will respond to you uh, via email in the next couple of days. If you have any questions now or in the days to come, shoot me an email. Uh, my address is there on the screen. It's john at tribetriathlon.net. And I will be more than happy to, to answer any questions that I can. So a couple that I've seen that are, are, are fairly common um, that I want to speak to. Uh, a couple people have, have expressed concerns about the cactus needles uh, causing flats. Um, Again, I, I, I've done this race twice. I've ridden the course numerous times. I've personally never had an issue uh, out here, knock on wood. Inevitably, you put 3,000 folks out there on a bike course uh, riding in, in relatively small loops. You're going to see flats. Um, obviously, we are in the middle of the desert. Obviously, there are a lot of cactus uh, all around the course, and, and they've got spiky things that fall off and blow onto the road. Um, not really a whole lot you can do about it. Um, a lot of folks will uh, opt for like a gator skin tire that it has a higher, um, puncture resistance, but that gator skin is guaranteed to slow you down in over 112 miles. You would probably be surprised how much it's going to slow you down. Um, so I've never felt the need to, to change my tires or anything like that. I go with my regular race day tire, um, and, and, and hope for the best so far as that goes. So, um, hopefully that's not an issue. Um, if, if you're really concerned with it, yeah, I mean, go with that, um, uh, that, that higher rated tire for, for puncture, uh, resistance, but wouldn't be my recommendation. Um, tubeless, uh, hopefully that's, that's less of an issue for the guys running, um, tubeless and you've got, uh, good amounts of, of sealant in there. So even if you did hit something like a, uh, cactus needle, it's, it's not going to, to be a big deal for you. Uh, if you do get a flat, there is neutral support out there. Good thing again about this, uh, shorter, uh, course is there's fewer miles for those uh, mechanics to to roam. Um, but that said, that is not guaranteed that a mechanic is going to get to you quickly. So definitely recommend being self-sufficient in uh, changing your tire. So have a flat kit uh, with you, whatever whatever you need to uh, recover from a flat, be um, efficient in, in doing that yourself. 
All right. Uh, last question I'm going to hit right now, because uh, several have asked, is about running a disc wheel. Um, I would say yes. If you have a disc, run it. Um, even if it's windy, uh, run it. Chances are within within certain limits. Um, far more concern here is your front wheel. Uh, that front wheel is hinged and that front wheel has less of your body weight over it. Typically you've got 60, 70% of your body weight over that rear wheel, which that only leaves, um, 30, 40% of your weight over that front wheel. And again, that wheel is hinged, hinged. Your back wheel is fixed. That disc isn't going to move like, uh, that front wheel. So, um, if you're concerned about the, the side winds, um, it's, it's chances are that front wheel is going to be a much bigger decision. So if you're running uh, a, a 80 millimeter, something like that, deep front wheel, that is going to catch wind when it's when it's significant, uh, more so than that rear disc uh, would. So um, I would say in, in vast majority of cases, uh, run the disc wheel. If you're concerned about the wind, that's going to be more of, of a decision for that front wheel. It's going to have a bigger impact um, on how you handle um, the wind. All right, guys, we are over time. You're tapering triathletes. You need your sleep. So uh, I'm going to end it there. Uh, get to bed. I want to thank you for, for taking time this evening. Uh, I, I want to wish you all the best. I hope this time has been beneficial for you. I hope you've picked up a couple of things that will uh, allow you to race uh, a little bit faster and really enjoy uh, this process. So um, I plan on being out there. I look forward to seeing you guys in the days leading into the race and out there on the course. Again, any questions that you have, please feel free to reach out. I will do all I can uh, to, to help out. So uh, again, good night. We'll see you guys in Tempe. Go be an Ironman.